All right, this is a fan who two days ago, two days ago, and two days, nine hours ago, um, did this. And basically, they talk about the lawsuit that's going on between Sega and Archie, between Archie, Sega, and Ken Penders. But also, they start out by talking about Worlds, worlds Collide. And again, this individual did this two days and nine hours ago. So here's what they had to say, and I quote, and I quote what, and I quote what they say. First, before we get into the real meat of this, I want to talk a little more about Worlds Collide. I don't really think it's a balanced story, and by that I mean that it doesn't represent both series equally. On the Sonic side of things, we have, one, the whole thing is Eggman's doing, two, Sonic's world is at stake, three, there are more Sonic characters. On the Mega Man side, we have, one, Mega Man, we have, okay, on the Mega Man side, we have, one, Mega Man is the more important hero, the addition of the Spin Dash Buster has reduced Sonic to a sidekick, two, the story the story is following the Mega Man structure only three times longer, which may cause pacing when three, when three, Flynn does his usual best three bosses in one issue stick, despite having more to feel. Wily is the more important villain. Eggman just tends to go along with everything he does, despite being the more experienced villain. Four, Mega Man is fully in character while Sonic is extremely casual about his best friend slash adoptive sibling and, mother and many of the friends being roboticized. Five, the Sonic continuity has been removed for the casuals who aren't familiar with Sonic, but more Mega Man continuity has been added for the Mega Man fans at the expense of the, mo uh, at the, expense of the same casuals that the Sonic continuity was removed for. Now, let's be honest here. This comic was mostly made to advertise each series to the readers of the other. Get the Mega Man fans interested in Sonic, get Sonic fans interested in Mega Man, and I don't think it's doing a very good job. It's worth noting that most of the praise is coming from fans who are already engaged in both series. At the same time, casual Sonic fans who don't know about Mega Man's continuity are wondering where all this stuff, where all this, where all this stuff that isn't in the comics came from. Not to mention that making it a future setting allows the use of the same criticism leveled against years later. And any Mega Man fans that decide that do decide to follow the Sonic series are suddenly going to experience the same thing in 252 when they are suddenly dropped into the death throes of a story that's been going on for two years and they are introduced to Mecha Sally, the Arctic Freedom Fighters, Team Freedom, that stupid Tails doll, Vagina Dickbot, Nagus, etc. Surely, the better choice would have been to include some continuity from both, though that it isn't so jarring when the real story resumes. Then they already know who Mecha Sally is and what the hell is going on. All right, before I get into the meat of his um, um, entry, his journal entry, let me explain this um, to anybody that may or may not agree with him. I said this before in an audio, and I will say this again. I said this on video. I said this in front of a camera. I've said this every time. To me, it's my own personal opinion, but I feel that this crossover is nothing more than a passing of the torch. That's what it is. It doesn't mean Archie Comics is going to... It does not mean Archie Comics is going to stop doing Sonic Comics. No. It just means that S Mega Man is basically, it, it just means basically that they're preparing Mega Man to be 
the to be their primary adventure series should a keyword there should the sonic should the license for the sonic comic come to an end that's basically what this crossover is it's not you can you could say whatever else you want to say about it but in reality my personal opinion in reality that's what it is it's a passing of the torch now does passing of the torch again mean that something goes away forever no it just means you're passing the torch saying it's your time you're the man you're the primary focus and unfortunately and unfortunately if you're a sonic fan that's the case here it's basically to pass the torch to mega man to the mega man comic and say it's your time you're going to be the primary focus now that's about it that's about it and again does that mean sonic's going to go away no the comic the sonic comic and its spin-offs and its graphic novels and all that and its super digest and all that they're still going to continue they're still going to be continued and sold people are still going to subscribe to them and all that but basically this in a way but but this basically is a fail safe a win the day and hopefully it'll be a long time for a long hopefully it'll be a long time from now but it's basically a fail safe for when the day comes and again hopefully it's a long time from now that the sonic license that the license for the Sonic comic comes to an end and it's never renewed. Because when that day comes, and let's say Mega Man's still going, Mega Man becomes the primary comic. That's what it is. He, became, he becomes the primary comic. Again, you could say whatever you want to say, but to me, in my honest opinion, and this is an answer to this individual and to anybody else that agrees or doesn't agree, is mainly a passing of the torch. Think of it this way. I'm a wrestling fan, right? I'm a wrestling fan. WrestleMania 6, Warrior versus Hogan, Warrior beat Hogan clean in the ring. What happened that night? As many people would put it, Hogan passed the torch to Warrior. Okay. Okay. Twelve years later, WrestleMania 18, Rock versus Hogan. Rock beats Hogan clean in the middle of the ring. What happens? Hulk again passes the torch. And then this, and then just this year, WrestleMania 29. WrestleMania 29, John Cena beats The Rock. What happens? Essentially, Rock, in many people's eyes, passes the torch to John Cena. Does that mean Rock's going to go away forever? No, he's still going to come back. He's still involved with the company. He's still involved with the company. I mean, originally, he was supposed to challenge John for the championship in a rematch at Extreme Rules. But again... But again, here's the deal. Just because he lost and he passed the torch doesn't mean he's going away. And I, and I know I'm I know I sound like a broken record, but essentially that's what this is. Just because you know, you know, you know just because because Mega Man, basically that's what this is. It's basically Sonic's the Sonic comic passing the torch to the Mega Man comic and basically saying it's your time, you're the primary focus. I'm still going to be around. Um, I'm still going to do my thing. But you are now the man. You are now the primary focus. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. But it is, in my opinion, a reality and a fact. Now, continuing on with what this person has to say now about the lawsuit. This is Continuing on what this person has to say about the lawsuit. Get a little drink of soda there. 
But here's what they have to say about the lawsuit. And I quote, Now for the real reason you clicked on this. Most Archie fans will be quick to tell you, currently, that Ken Penders is the spawn of Mephilus, and that Archie are poor victims of his evil, unfair lawsuit. This is the interpretation that everyone has been throwing about lately. And there has been so much hate against Penders that Ian Flynn has had to ban any talk of Penders, the person from Bumble King, or he could lose his job. The interpretation is wholly entirely wrong. A while ago, Penders noticed that Archie was reprinting the stories he wrote making money off them. And furthermore, he wasn't seeing a cent. He went to Archie's headquarters and confronted them, asking to be paid the royalties that he felt he deserved. Archie refused. Pendus pointed out that technically he held the copyrights for the characters and stories. He said that he would rather not have to file the copyright and force the removal of his characters. He just wants his money and the right to produce his spinoff. Archie, instead of just doing the smart thing thing, or trying to negotiate immediately, or Archie, instead, okay, excuse me, Archie, instead of doing, Archie, in, instead of just doing the smart thing or trying to negotiate, immediately filed a lawsuit against Ken. That's right, people. Penders did not sue Archie. Archie sued him. Of course, as we've established, Archie's higher-ups are, in fact, complete idiots. Who do things like mandate that all stories to be... Okay. Who mandate... Okay. Of course, we've... Of course, as we've established, Archie's higher-ups are, in fact, complete idiots. Who do things like mandate that all stories be canon, leading to all the creation of the leading to all of the creation of the retcon beams and the continuity issues in Worlds Collide. Give the rather important job of creating Sally's rival to somebody who didn't like Sally, and in this case, lost Pender's blankety-blank contract so that they had no evidence to support themselves. Pender's, who, while a bit of a dick at times, and certainly rather mad, is evidently smarter than Archie, prompting produce prompting uh, pr promptly. Okay, Penders, who while a bit of a dick at times and certainly rather mad, is evidently is evidently smarter than Archie, promptly produced some evidence, and it became clear to Archie that this case was unwinnable. Thus, we got the settlement. We don't know the contents of the se this settlement. Even Flynn is out on the loop on the legal proceedings. But I presume it's just results in Penders getting what he wanted in the first place. And then Sega decided that they didn't like the settlement and told Archie to go back and continue the legal battle. Naturally, the case was still unwinnable, and this led to the endangered species debacle. Oh, okay, and this led to the endangered species debacle when Archie was suddenly legally required to stop using Pender's characters and the whole story imploded, taking with it several plot crucial characters like Jeffrey and Eliza, as well as making it likely that Hershey surviving will have to become non canon, and ensuring that the echidnas remain stuck in their pocket dimension forever. Then the judge realized that the only reason they were all still there was because of Sega, who claimed that they wanted nothing to do with the lawsuit. This strengthens my theory that Archie was originally going to have to pay Penders his royalties, and, Se and Sega sent them back because they didn't want Archie to give anyone else the money that they wanted. He promptly called in Sega to actually get involved. Naturally, this will put a strain on Archie's relationship with Sega, and could lead to the cancellation of the comic and the end of Archie's license to produce comics about the characters. Now, while some of you reading this will think that's good, it isn't. If it were to happen, any comic we 
skit will be riddled with all the problems that Sega mandates mandates cause in Archie. Stagment characters, sterilized storylines, no emotional empathy, overuse of Eggman in every story arc, in every story, etc. But it won't have any non-Sega characters to balance it out and provide any of what makes a comic actually enjoyable. In short, any replacement will be worse than Archie. So while Penders has been demonized, uh, demonized, so while Penders has been demonized by everyone and their mother, this whole thing was caused because Archie comics are money-grabbing dicks that refuse to give Penders a cent of the money they were making from his own hard work. All right. Now I know a lot of people are going to disagree and agree with the, agree and disagree with this individual. But one thing in my rebuttal to this this thing here is Sega they're not going to like being called in. And yet it may cause a strain, but Sega's going to be smart enough to realize, yeah, we're not happy with Archie having to get us drug into this, but we're not going to cancel anything because they're making good money and we're getting a good percentage of that money. But what's going to happen primarily is Sega is going to be like, okay, Ken, you want your characters, but primarily when you put them into the book, they became our characters. How can we work this out? And this is what I see happening. He is going to get his royalties, and he's going to get his story published, but he's going to get his story published courtesy of Archie Comics. That's right. Archie Comics is going to publish the story. And it's, but, but here's the thing. Archie Comics, I've got this feeling, indirectly will not publish it. We will pub. Okay, let, let me let me kind of see if I can balance this out. Archie Comics will publish his story as a result of what happens in the in the end, but they'll be publishing it under the red circle line, the red circle line, which tends to be more for the older readers, for the more mature readers. That's what I believe he's going to have it published under. That's what I believe is going to be the, be the settlement in the negotiation. It's going to be like, okay, here's your royalties. And yes, we'll, and yes, you could put your care. But basically, I just feel that's what's going to happen. Basically, it's going to be an agreement to where the characters will be back in the comics, but the Lawless Sioux Chronicle book and stories will be published courtesy of Archie Comics, Red Circle Comics. I've got that feeling. I don't know why. I don't know why. I just do. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I don't think it's going to lead to a cancellation of the book. Archie Comics is making too much money off it. And at the same time, Sega's getting a good percentage of that money as well that they're making off it. So I don't think it's going to lead to any cancellations whatsoever. So that's all I have to say about it. I'll provide a link to this person's um, little rant, if you will, down below. Let us know what you guys think. Comment below. Video responses are greatly appreciated. Talk to you later.